We might be a small island, but we've got an epic history. And there's a wealth of untold secrets still to uncover. So every year, hundreds of archaeologists dig, dive and sift to find clues. Absolutely I've never seen anything, anything like, that. like it before. It's just amazing. In 2018, their discoveries have been more exciting than ever. Look at that. So that's from a tank then? That's yeah. brilliant. That's a nice find. Not bad for day two. Not bad at all. Each excavation has been filmed as it happened by the archaeologists themselves. Their dig diaries mean that we can be there for every exciting moment of discovery. And you imagine him looking over his shoulder trying to get away from the enemy aircraft through that. I'll be in the lab where the teams will bring in their finds from pottery and metalwork to human remains and we'll take a closer look to find out what these new digs can tell us about our ancestors. Look at that. Be very careful. I will be careful. Oh, my goodness. While archaeologist Raksha Dave looks into the analysis that goes on long after a dig is finished. Somebody stabbed her in the back of the head. What an awful way to go. Welcome to Digging for Britain. In this programme, I'm joining archaeologists in the west of the country to share their biggest discoveries. At Silchester, we investigate a monumental bathhouse, revealing how the Romans first stamped their mark on Britain. The preservation of the blocks and the bricks is absolutely superb. In Bath, construction work beneath the magnificent medieval abbey takes us on an incredible journey through the city's multi-layered hidden past. This is probably late 13th or 14th century. Quite incredible that this has survived. And near Winchester, a team unlocked the secrets of a vast 18th century military camp occupied by a horde of German mercenaries. It looks gold leaf on it. It's really, really shiny. It's not the sort of thing you expect in a military field kitchen. No, not at all. And at the Museum of Somerset in Taunton, I'll discover how objects here help us tell the story of the West. Our first dig takes us off the coast of Portsmouth to a major underwater investigation into an 18th century ship that revolutionised the Royal Navy. There are around 40,000 ships wrecked around the British coastline, but the chance to excavate one is incredibly rare. It is monumentally expensive and usually only happens when the ship is of national importance and under threat of destruction. Now, both are true for HMS Invincible, and this is the largest underwater excavation since the Mary Rose. For centuries, our nation's power lay in our maritime might. But at the start of the 18th century, Britain's navy was in danger of losing its edge. Then, in 1747, the Royal Navy captured the French ship L'Invincible, a cutting-edge, streamlined 74-gun ship that could literally blow anything out of the water. Renamed HMS Invincible, it became the flagship of the British Navy until it ran aground on the 19th of February, 1758. The wreck of the Invincible provides us with an unprecedented opportunity to discover how the 18th century Navy was being revolutionised. And now that shifting sands are putting the wreck under threat, no expense is being spared to recover as much as possible. A combined team from Bournemouth University, the Maritime Archaeology Trust and the National Museum of the Royal Navy is carrying out this £2 million project to salvage the remains of the wreck. And halfway through the three-year project, the clock is ticking to retrieve what evidence is left. It's all about trying to recover as much as we can, record it as quickly as we can, because during the winter, we have high energy storm events, and this is exposing vulnerable and fragile artifacts as well as the ship structure. The maritime archeologists rely on huge suction tubes to suck up the sand and blow it away from the site. They're constantly battling the threatening tides. 
But on day one, precious artifacts begin to surface. One of the first things to come up, a fully intact gunpowder barrel. There would have been over 300 barrels of gunpowder on board. That's the gunpowder. And actually, you see underwater when they're moving it, you just get clouds of black. It is a pretty bad smell. So that's the sulfur. It's a great start, indicating that some of the key armaments are still on board. And with their expert eyes scouring the wreck, the divers are soon rewarded with even more gun accessories. These coins here, coins were used for supporting the breech end of the guns, clearly labelled with the gun type. So here we have the nine pounder coin, and next to it, the much larger 32 pounder coin. Everything's labelled. So when you've got the chaos of battle going on, they know exactly where to go to get the 32 pounder coin, the nine pounder. With every new discovery, the archaeologists are revealing why Invincible was such a formidable ship. And it wasn't just her superlative firepower. We're learning where they stored things, how they stored things. It shows the organisation, the professionalism, the discipline. As the season nears its end, the archaeologists suddenly make their most exciting discovery yet. guns. The Invincible bristled with an amazing 74 cannons, but until now the team had thought that many of these had been recovered when the ship was wrecked. But what's really important about this is an unexpected find. We assumed that all of the guns that weren't jettisoned were recovered from the Invincible, so it's great that we found these. These guns are a rare and important discovery and I've invited site directors Dan and Dave into the studio to discuss the team's finds and what they've learned about the ship that revolutionised our Navy. Dan, looking at you excavating this ship, it looks as though it's incredibly shallow. It is. The site is only in eight to nine metres of water. And being that shallow, presumably, as soon as you do get a storm, it's hugely at risk because the energy of the waves will be transmitted down. Exactly. Then material becomes exposed. You can see from the two blocks at the end there, they were identical when made, and they both ended up in the water at the same time. But one is still perfect, and that was yeah. buried within the wreck. But once things are exposed, they're a food source for marine life, and they just disappear. And is this one of the smaller guns that came up? Yes, this is called a swivel gun. It's an anti-personnel weapon. So it's when you come close to the enemy, when you're side by side. And we found them low down on the ship. So they weren't in use at the time. So we're learning something new, yeah. that they stored these weapons and we're only going to bring them out when they needed them, when they're at close quarters with the enemy. And we weren't expecting to find these. So it was a really nice addition to the finds. And I think one of the most overwhelming things is the smell. Is that the rope that we can smell? That is the rope. It kind of takes you back in time. Yeah. This is a smell that hasn't changed since 1758. And this is exactly oh, what the sailors would have smelt. It's that tar. It's, it's the tarry. Pitch. Yeah. And it still smells 250 years later. I know. I, I really love it. It enables us as archaeologists to really sense what it was like on board yeah. the ship. Yeah. And we found out that it's actually junk. So it wasn't going to be used in the rigging. It was going to be used in the making of these objects, which are known as gun wads. So the old rope that's in the bottom of the ship is there to be picked apart and made into these wads? That's it. So it's for the process of uh, loading and firing the guns. You would load the cannons, ramming down your powder charge with this. This is a rammer head. You would then ram down one of those wads to kind of seal the charge. Mm. You would then ram down the shot. And to stop that shot rolling back out the barrel of the gun, you would have to ram down another wad. Yeah. So they're essential. Yeah. And what about these pieces of wood here with marks on? What are they? And these are tally sticks that went with these wads to show which size of gun they would be used for. So right. in Roman numerals, we have 32 yeah. for the 32-pounder. And 24. And 24 for the 24-pounder. So this shows the organisation on board. And what have you got in that box? Well, what I've got here is a small timer. <gasps> Look at that. It's used for calculating the speed of the vessel. Dave, is that glass? That's glass. And it's intact? It's intact, as it was when the ship sank, and it was found on the shelf. It was placed on when it was last used. Can I hold it? You can, 
but be very careful. I will be careful. OK. Oh, my goodness. And that's a 28-second timer, because you run a length of rope over the stern of the vessel with knots in every 47 feet. Yeah. And after 28 seconds, the number of knots that have run through your hands are the speed of the vessel. Yeah. Yeah, so they have 28 the seconds. That's what. Yeah. That's where knots comes from. That's yeah. right. I just cannot believe that this has survived intact 250 years on the seabed, and it's made of wood and glass. And there it is. It's perfect. And I'm really nervous about holding it, so I'm going to hand it back <laughs> to you. Should we put it back? Okay, oh my I've goodness. So what we've got here is an astonishing demonstration of the level of organisation that was going on in the navy by the 18th century. That's it. We have the evidence for a well-organised, disciplined navy, which is a complete contrast to the previous century, where they're a lot more dysfunctional, there's been catastrophic disasters due to a lack of discipline and organisation on board. This ambitious dig has revealed exactly why HMS Invincible became the model for future cutting-edge ship design in the British Navy and why in the century that followed, Britain could boast that it ruled the waves. <laughs>